Good evening and welcome to The Way Out Show. I'm your host, Dane McCarthy, broadcasting to you from FEMA Region 5, deep in the bowels of the United Police State of Amnesia. Today is October 3rd, 2014. And as usual, the events are cascading down upon us like uh, an, an avalanche and the hurricane of, of, uh, ha of actions by people around the world becomes be bewildering and overwhelming. And I'm here to try to give you a boil down and some perspective on how it all shakes out. And to give you maybe, if you possibly can, because I'm trying to work this out myself, how this all works. Because we have to remember that at the very highest levels, there is a, a game of chess that's in play, and the pieces are in play now, and they're moving. And we're even seeing some, some uh, the game being, being moved onto the soil of the United States, and that would be uh, in the terrifying new threat of Ebola, which is now uh, apparently from the latest news, there are f now four cases scattered around, one in Toronto, one in Washington, D.C., of course, the one in Dallas, and there's another one somewhere. And so these are appearing, these Ebola cases are appearing in scattered places at s almost simultaneously. And this is to spread, of course, the terror evenly so that the entire continent is in a state of panic. And this is and they will cling to the government. The reason why uh, governments need terror is because it makes the, go makes the people uh, uh, try, try, try to give the governments more power because they, the people see that only the government can save them from this, from this threat. And so the governments themselves ramp up the threats or they don't do enough to stop the threats, or occasionally they even, and well actually very often, they actually create the threats. Or the threat may not even really be real. It's a phony threat. Much as we saw in this unbelievably long Cold War period that takes place from the end of World War II all the way up, if you can believe it, to the, to the early 1990s with the fall of the Soviet Union. So that both of the great superpowers in the world were able to sustain their existence and force or, or create enough fear within their own populations in order to, to sustain themselves and, and, and bolster their power by the threat of the other. So each side was helping the other by being enemies of each other. The Soviet Union was gaining because the people of the Soviet Union feared the West. And, and they feared the rest West because the propaganda of their own country told them that uh, the Americans were demons, that uh, the same thing happened in, in, in Asia, where there were demons, uh, they were bloodthirsty warmonger capitalists um, who uh, would like to take everything they had and enslave them and kill them and and of course this is exactly what people in the West were told that the Russians the people of the Soviet Union would do <laughs> of course the reality of this is is that when an ordinary Russian and an ordinary American would get together it would be like wow we're exactly the same you know, they would be laughing and they'd be talking. And people actually caught on to this back in, by the, really by the early 60s, um, Americans and Russians very much caught on to what was going on. So you saw in the media parodies in movies and TV shows. It became a joke. And yet, nevertheless, our governments, no one could stop this juggernaut. No one can stop this, the, the, the thrust of events, the power of the fear uh, is very long-lasting. And at the end of the 
Cold War, which happened as a result where people just didn't believe it anymore. You know, that they didn't believe that Russia was a threat, that Soviet Union was a threat. And they just, it became pointless, it became a joke, it became such a joke that people just said, let's just tear this wall down. And, and they did, and they tore it down. And they shook hands on either side of the wall, and this is, I'm talking about the Berlin Wall. Uh, and at the same time, of course, the power of the Soviet Union had, had, had collapsed. Uh, and uh, so everybody thought, okay, this is great, we're going to have peace. Well, not everybody thought this was great. A lot of people thought this is terrible. This is a catastrophe that we no longer have the Cold War. What are we going to do? And people were freaking out in the, in the Pentagon. People were freaking out at the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. People were freaking out in the various, in the intelligence community of all of the uh, many, many countries around the world. And they were, because suddenly their purpose no longer exists. And this, for these people, is a psychological, very deep purpose. They must have an enemy. Their whole life is about beating an enemy. That's, they, they don't feel that their life has any purpose unless they have something to push against, a struggle. They're not content with just having a happy life. Uh, so there's also political reasons as well as psychological reasons and really spiritual reasons. But, it, you know, this just goes on and on and on. So anyway, today we're looking at uh, a lot of different things going on right now. But I would like, before I do anything else, to show you a very short video of President Obama speaking from a teleprompter at a speech, giving a speech, and he uses a very Orwellian phrase, uh, which is chilling, and I'm going to show it to you and then I'll comment about it. So let's roll that. The ideology of ISIL or Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram will wilt and die if it is consistently exposed and confronted and refuted in the light of day. Look at the new form for promoting peace in Muslim societies. Sheikh bin Bayad described its purpose. We must declare war on war so the outcome will be peace upon peace. We must declare war on war so the outcome will be peace upon peace. I think that allowing for the book being after all a parody, something like 1984 could actually happen. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. We must declare war on war so the outcome will be peace upon peace. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. We must declare war on war so the outcome will be peace upon peace. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. Okay, so short but sweet and very chilling and powerful statement there by George Orwell himself. A message to the world, to the future, to the younger generations that would come uh, in the future. And we've seen, of course, this very uh, scenario play out over and over and over in the years following the publication of 1984, way back in 1948, which is right at the beginning of the Cold War. So, uh, and you notice that Obama's, con uh, his exhortation in order to get that vote to attack Syria in 2013, which was temporarily derailed by Putin, actually, if you remember, uh, he uh, was saying we need this war in order to secure peace 
Uh, and this is what uh, leaders have always told us. In other words, war brings peace. Well, war continues in reality to bring more war and more war and more war. In fact, Obama, being the spokesman that he is, really is not even involved in this whole thing. He's merely the front man. He doesn't make very many of his own decisions, if any. And we know, of course, that he spends a lot of his time on the golf course uh, taking vacations, and he just kicks back a lot. And, and, and they roll him out, and he's, he's a good speaker, and he knows how to read from a teleprompter. But uh, he really is not qualified to really lead, but it doesn't matter because there are plenty of people behind the scenes who are the same people, whether the administration is Democratic or Republican, or they may not be the exact same people, but they have similar views or identical views, like Zbigniew Brzezinski and Brent Scowcroft, for instance. One who works for the Democrats and one who works for the Republicans. And these are close advisors and planners, and yet they're able to agree on virtually everything and have written literally books together uh, outlining their plans for the future, which are essentially identical. In other words, so while it appears that you have two opposing parties, running the United States and directing policy, uh, foreign policy and domestic policy, they actually are fooling the American people and it's a deception. And as it always, uh, this is nothing new. Governments have been deceiving their, their uh, citizens from way, way, way back. And of course, citizens have been attempting to struggle against uh, the jackboot of government for a very, very long time. Uh, and <clears throat> it will continue to do so. Right now we're looking at uh, what's called the, being called the long war. If you haven't heard that term, down the road you will hear it more because that is the actual name of the war we're in with terror. And of course it's all a pretext in order to continue uh, what the 19th century called the great game, and that is the grand chess board, the great game of chess that's played between uh, uh, countries, between empires, between the East and the West, and it's for control of the world, for control of the natural resources. Uh, I was just hearing uh, that uh, Putin himself has designs and plans, and that will be to uh, regain the former glory and make uh, of the Soviet Union and make Russia a a major player once again a superpower on the world stage, and that would be by creating and leading uh, his own Eurasian Union. Now you have to wonder about this because we have the African Union, we have the European Union, the EU, we have. The, the North American Union, the South American Union, the Asian, the East Asian Union. Now these are not officially, have not officially been created except for the European Union. But the, the, it's interesting to note that the Eurasian, the idea of the Eurasian Union, this is not Putin's idea, but this is part uh, of the idea of the Trilateral Commission, which, which wants to unify the various continents of the various countries of the various continents into unions and ultimately unify all those unions into one global union which would be the ultimate dream of the new world order global governance under one small group of men one politburo at the very top one group of elites, one group of aristocrats. Because if it were, if it were allowed, if this global union, once it's clearly established, if it were allowed to continue, it would eventually, and this is virtually inevitable, if it was allowed to continue, if it was able to control its power and create a dynasty, a kind of a dynasty, a dynastic class 
of controllers who have global power. What would inevitably evolve or devolve into would be an empire, a global empire that has never happened before, but has been a dream of ambitious psychopath, psychopathic men since recorded history and probably from before recorded history. Uh, and they would be more, they would inevitably be uh, virtually, they would have to be a psychopath. Only a psychopath could do what it is necessary to do to, to keep the entire globe under the boot heel, under the jack boot of uh, this global governance, new world order, neo-feudalistic, uh, because it would, that's, that's the dream of the neo-feudalists that uh, get, they want to be on top and, and they own everything. Feudalism, in feudalism the king owns everything and everyone else is a serf or a slave essentially. Uh, and you have their tech, they have their technician class, they have the surf class, and uh, this is one of the reasons why s these weaponized viruses like anthrax, like HIV, like now Ebola, have been released, and there are others, believe me, that have been weaponized. This is why they have been released, is because it's fear, it's control, it's martial law. It's uh, voluntarily giving up your rights in order to save your life, supposedly. Um, it's um, population reduction. This is all part of it. Um, if, and they liked Ebola. I've been talking about Ebola. I'm not the person who came up with this, but many people have been talking about Ebola for quite a long time. And now we're seeing it rolled out in various parts of the, of the world. Um, and you, if you remember, Ebola usually starts in villages, in rural areas. And typically what would happen is somebody would get Ebola from eating like a, a monkey that had Ebola, because that's where it started, was in monkeys. And maybe they didn't cook it right. And so they got the virus and they would catch this horrifying disease which really killed you fast. It dissolves your organs. You die really fast. Uh, and then, but this one started in a urban setting in a hospital. And there were, my understanding is that there were uh, bioweapon uh, experts, scientists, in place at that hospital at that time, which makes you wonder, is there a connection? Was it just a coincidence? I think not, because somebody, in the, many people in the scientific community believe that the, that the they truly believe this, that the, the, the most basic problem in the world today is that there's too many people. That, that they're behind climate change, too many people. Uh, poverty, too many people. All of the major problems. So for them to create the ut utopia that they want would, be, m would mean that it would be first essential to exterminate, to liquidate approximately at least minimum 90% of the people on the planet. Of course, not them, but those extra people that they feel are no longer needed in the utopian world that they want to create. Okay, so let's go and look at the, some of the more of the details of uh, some of the events that are happening in the last few days, in the last week. And um, of course, the Middle East is in play right now, as is Ukraine. And there's no one better that I've found, a true insider, uh, to explicate and explain and in, a, in a very clear and simple fashion uh, then Syrian girl, the, the young journalist from Syria who is apparently a lot of contacts uh, and she can give you some detailed information. So let's, this is about 10 or 11 minutes long, so let's roll that clip.
in complete violation of the US Constitution, the Obama White House and the Peace Prize president has once again launched an illegal bombing campaign, this time in Syria, supposedly in the name of neutralizing ISIS terrorists. By brazenly ignoring Congress once again and claiming justification for the attacks under a 2001 directive which expressly limited military action to be used only against those involved in 9-11, Obama has yet again committed an impeachable offence. But aside from the legality of the assault, what's the true agenda behind US airstrikes on Syria? Are we to believe that the White House, along with Saudi Arabia and Jordan, two countries which funded and armed ISIS to begin with, intend to limit their attacks merely to target Islamic State militants? Or is the Assad government in Syria, which those three countries have been attempting to overthrow for three years, the ultimate target? And what's the wider agenda towards Syria as a whole? Here to break it down for us is regular InfoWars contributor, Syrian activist and blogger Mimi al laham Today, both the US and Israel have attacked Syrian sovereign land illegally without a UN resolution or consent from the Syrian government. Contrary to what you may have heard, the Syrian government did not give permission and was not asked for permission by the US government. Simply being told that an attack is going to happen doesn't make it any less of a breach of sovereignty if consent is not given. I'm here to say we, the Syrian people, irrespective of any politician, reject and resist this illegal war. Almost exactly one year ago, the majority of US people rejected the war on Syria. That was when it was obvious that the US would be entering that war on the side of Al-Qaeda. But the wolf changed into sheep's clothing, and now many people believe the US is attacking Syria on the basis of fighting ISIS, the new Al-Qaeda. But that is not the truth. In this video, I'm going to tell you exactly why and how these airstrikes will not defeat ISIS. The US government and military industrial machine have basically three excuses they cycle through to sell their wars to the American people. Number one, democracy and regime change. Number two, WMDs and chemical weapons. And number three, fighting Al-Qaeda and terrorism. A decade ago, in the lead-up to the Iraq war, all three of these excuses were used. And these exact same excuses are now being used to start a war with Syria, from WMDs to regime change and now finally fighting Al-Qaeda, which seems to be the easiest one to sell. So please, don't buy it. Because even whilst the US was backing Al-Qaeda in Libya and Syria, some of us already knew they would eventually use them as an excuse to start a war. Indeed, it was the US foreign policy that created groups like ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. It was Obama's support for extremists in Libya and Syria that led to the rise of al-Qaeda in these countries. They talk about moderate rebels, but many of those moderate rebels defected to ISIS or are still fighting alongside either ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra, the other al-Qaeda faction. You see, the US government creates the terrorists that it then exploits US soldiers to fight. Let Hillary Clinton tell you herself. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen, and let's great, let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam. You see, the U.S. government needed groups like ISIS in order to weaken Syria before they could attack. Syria has a powerful air defense system, and the Pentagon admitted that it would make Syria difficult to attack. So again, I predicted that the US would attack Syrian soil once ISIS takes out Syrian air defenses near Raqqa. I said this in a video last month. Tabaka Air Base near Raqqa may contain S-300 anti-air missile defense systems. This is why ISIS, the US government proxy army, are now throwing everything they have at the air base and have been for the last few days. Without this airbase, the US airplanes could potentially fly over that region without being harassed by Syria's air defenses. And that is exactly what happened with the fall of Takba airbase. And now US planes are flying over Syrian skies 
outside of the reach of Syrian air defenses. But even after all of this, the US military is still afraid of Syrian air defenses, which is why they deployed the F-22 Raptor stealth jet for the first time ever. It's probably also the reason they quietly whispered to the Syrian ambassador at the UN that they are going to attack. But it didn't seem to help because they're still intimidated. They could only use Tomahawk missiles, not jets, on the west of Syria, where the air defenses are still strong. It's a big joke that the US coalition against ISIS includes Saudi Arabia, the country who has conducted more beheadings than ISIS this month. Saudi Arabia is an example of the kind of state that ISIS wants to create, minus the McDonald's of course. Both coalition members, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, are the main bankrollers of Al-Qaeda. It's no coincidence that Qatar had enough influence with Jabhat al-Nusra to negotiate the release of UN peacekeepers. US airstrikes against ISIS will not defeat ISIS, instead more and more of these idiots will simply join ISIS believing their cause against the US has been vindicated. ISIS ranks will swell and the war is going to continue indefinitely. If the US really wanted to fight ISIS, they would stop their ally Turkey from giving them safe haven, medical treatment and allowing them to cross the Syrian-Turkish border. If the US really wanted to fight Al-Qaeda, they would not let their ally Israel provide Al-Qaeda Jabhat al-Nusra faction with air defenses, medical aid on the Golan Heights border. And just today, Israel shot down a Syrian MiG that was targeting Jabhat al-Nusra in order to defend them. It's ironic that for the last few years, those liberal humanitarian warmongers were calling for US humanitarian intervention against Syria to save Syrian children. But when the US bombs ISIS and levels homes and kills babies in Idlib, these so-called humanitarians, including Amnesty International, are oddly silent. Killing babies in order to save babies? I think not. These wars are not about humanitarianism or protecting minorities or fighting ISIS. There are other objectives here. The US government's real objectives in attacking Syria is to destroy it, the Syrian state, military and the country, breaking it up into three pieces, creating a scenario for perpetual war. They don't even try to conceal this objective. Andrew Tabler from the Washington Institute states this agenda quite plainly. The outcome of defeating ISIS will likely be a formal partition of Syria, Assad in the west, a Sunni center, and Kurds in the northeast. He then states the breakup of Syria will break up the Syria-Iran alliance. These war planners believe that all the bloodshed is worth it. That includes a few beheaded US journalists. Now Kerry is claiming that Syria didn't uphold the chemical weapons bargain. Just as Bush accused Saddam of doing the same. A year ago, when we were facing a similar attack on Syria, I said that the US would not attack while Syria still had chemical weapons and that they would try to disarm Syria first. This was before this scenario was even mentioned in any media. And I just said, you know, the, the US government is not going to attack a country that possesses weapons of mass destruction. They first have to remove them. I said that giving up those chemical weapons would leave us open to attack later, just like give, giving up chemical weapons left Iraq and Libya open to attack. And almost exactly a month after the chemical weapons were removed, the US began attacking Syrian soil, just as I predicted. Now, Kerry's timely declaration that Syria didn't uphold the chemical weapons deal, it sounds like an excuse to attack the Syrian army as well as ISIS. Eventually, a cornered cat retaliates though, and one wonders what Russia's reaction will be. This is the part that concerns us all, and I assure you, it is far more dangerous to your livelihoods than ISIS will ever be. In the backdrop of all of this happening, the US dropped its ExxonMobil deal with Russia. Russia has sent a cruiser to the port of Tartus in response to the US Tomahawk missile attacks from the Mediterranean Sea to Idlib. Russia has provided Syria with new air defenses and have said that the US airstrikes are illegal. The US government has flagrantly forgone getting approval from either the American people or the United Nations. It is wise to remember the breakdown of the League of Nations was what led to World War II. Are we now witnessing the breakdown of the United Nations? 
To all those patriots who love their country and sanity, I implore you to re-energize the sleeping anti-war movement. Stop this mess before it ends us all. We are the resistance. Okay. There you have uh, a really excellent and concise breakdown of recent events in Iraq and Syria from the point of view of uh, a Syrian national herself, uh, the uh, more and more popular and getting quite well known, famous uh, Syrian girl, journalist, alternative, an alternative view of what is going on. Now, we are not hearing this from the mainstream media press, although, as she pointed out, she could back up what she is saying in her, her perspective by uh, news reports coming out of the mainstream media itself. So if you put it together, if you put it all together, it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, time and time again, the American people have been lied to by our own government, and there is absolutely no reason why we would not be being lied to right now. This is the beginning, of course, of an, an entirely new level of conflict in the Middle East. The United States is and its allies are determined that they will not give up their presence, their footprint in the Middle East. There's too much at stake for them, and they don't care how many people they have to kill. They don't how many. They don't care how many American journalists, how many uh, U.S. combat troops or uh, contractors will have to die in order for them, for their uh, goals. Uh, to be to be gained that I remember hearing a few years ago that it was uh, someone was asked if the United States would ever leave the Middle East and they said no we'll never leave the Middle East because why would we give up the gains that we've made in the Middle East this is several years ago and this is when people were still believing that the reason why the United States was in Iraq was in order to um, to fight Al-Qaeda, I guess, uh, or get there. We, it was never really clear why. Well, we were told that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and that he was about to launch a nuclear weapon against the United States. Remember the famous uh, statement uh, that, uh, you know, that w the next thing American people will be seeing will be a, a, a mushroom cloud. This is just bald-faced lie major disinformation, propaganda by the government. Uh, George W. Bush, you know, has just notorious for making up stories. Well, the Obama administration has continued in the same policy uh, and the, uh, so there is no going away from the Middle East. Um, the Obama administration, after the new regime came in uh, with, into Baghdad, into Iraq, uh, they now have the piece of paper signed, sealed, and delivered, which will give the U.S. the go-ahead for continuing presence of U.S. combat troops in Iraq. And this is for the indefinite future. And, not only, and what they wanted also, not just the presence of combat troops, but it was required that, co that the U.S. troops would not be accountable for any of their actions under Iraqi law. This is, of course, essential. This means they can kill anybody, they can torture anybody, they can do whatever they want, and nobody in Iraq can, sit, can lift a finger to stop them. This is, of course, this is required uh, in order for the depredations for the occupation, whatever you want to call it, for the operations, the covert operations, to go on, to continue on, in order to, to secure Iraq in the grand game of chess that's being played. Their point of view is, if the United States doesn't own Iraq, then somebody else eventually will, or it will become an independent, independent country like Saddam Hussein did with Iraq. Saddam Hussein, when he was deposed, just before he was deposed by the West, was getting too big for his britches. He had outgrown 
uh, his dependence on the West. Remember, it was the West that put Saddam Hussein and Iraq in power in the first place. It was the West that supported him. It was the, uh, in his war with Iran, Iran, because Iran during the 80s was considered to be uh, the major threat uh, because, uh, to the West because it was aligned with the Eastern powers, with Russia, and it still to a certain extent is. But as, as uh, these things go, these, these uh, al allies, they change. The alliances change because you have different factions that gain control, the Shia, Shia and the Sunni, the Wahhabists, as uh, Hillary Clinton in that clip mentioned, from Saudi Arabia, are all players and they're struggling with each other. And behind these religious groups are very powerful secular figures, billionaires, multinational corporations uh, that are some of them Saudi Arabia, Arabian, some of them uh, from Qatar, uh, United Arab uh, Emirates, and other countries like Jordan who want to be, who are all struggling for, for control of these natural resources. And the pawns in this grand chess game are always the ordinary people, the defenseless civilians, the women and children. They have to su suffer the casualties, most of the casualties. What the United States is doing right now, at this very moment, is bombing Syria and Iraq. Mostly, it, but the real target is uh, Syria. After all, we now have the go-ahead to stay in Iraq. Well and good. Uh, ISIS, which as Syrian girl points out, was created by the Western powers, just like Al-Qaeda was created by the Western powers, and uh, these other extremists uh, to, to, to mix things up, to keep the, co the pot stirred, well stirred, uh, to, to, to keep the factions, the various factions, fighting each other, to make these countries unstable, to weaken them. You must weaken countries before you can uh, overthrow them, or occupy them, or dominate them, or exploit them. A country that has a strong sense of self, that has strong national sovereignty, is a difficult country to exploit and extract those natural resources. Why? Because <laughs> the people who are in those countries realize and understand that they have a right to exploit their own natural resources to enrich in the country, to enrich in the people, to enrich in the leadership, hopefully everyone. The way a country should work is the people in that country should have control over their own country, but they don't want that. And this is one of the reasons why global governance is just such a really, really bad idea. And that's because everyone loses national sovereignty. And it gets to the point where you, le you lose personal sovereignty. And that's what they would like to do in the United States. People in the United States have a, have a sense of personal sovereignty. They have, we have a right to our own property. What, we own, what I own belongs to me, we think, in the United States. Uh, my family, my children belong to, to me. They don't belong to the state. Uh, and uh, my my work that I do, the, the, the fruits of my labor belong to me. I worked for them and I own them because I earned them. Well, in, when you lose personal, when you lose national sovereignty and you lose state sovereignty and you lose, lose municipal sovereignty and you then eventually you're going to lose personal sovereignty and we're really already seeing this in the United States and many people don't understand that when, like in a communist country, when everyone owns everything, as in, the, this is the communist dream, the utopian dream of the communists. It's like the rich and the aristocrats won't, won't own everything in this monarchy, this feudalist society that we have in Russia, but the ordinary people will own everything. Everyone will own everything. And when you have everyone owning everything, somebody's got to control things on the top. Somebody's got to run the show. Not everyone, you can't, everyone cannot be a chief. You've got to have 
plenty of Indians. Well, what ends up happening is everybody who owns everything ends up owning nothing. And the state essentially controls everything. Now, they may not actually own it, but they control it. And that's even better than owning it or just as good as. This is the, 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 one of the main watchwords of the, uh, the Rockefeller family. <laughs> this is what they tell their kids when they're reading, instead of reading them bedtime stories at night, the Rockefellers tell their kids, own nothing, control everything. That's the goal. That's, that's the watchword. Own nothing, control everything. That way, you don't have to have res take responsibility Ownership implies responsibility. But if you control it and you don't own it, you can, you can uh, suck off the good stuff and you don't have to worry about the rest. The, uh, the way that corporate, the w corporate world is, is you, you externalize the expenses and you reap the profits. So, you, in other words, the bad stuff, you don't have to pay for. You're not responsible. You're not accountable for that. You make the taxpayers pay for that, but you just get the benefits from it. That would be the model, the business model of the control, but not the ownership. Uh, so, this is uh, the way it seems to me that things are going uh, <clears throat> with... Uh, the Middle East right at the moment. Uh, Syrian Girl does a great job of really breaking it down. Uh, Ukraine, m much is going on in Ukraine. I mentioned uh, that uh, Ukraine is in play right at the moment too. But right at, also today, I'm hearing that the eastern part of Ukraine appears to be secured more and more by the rebels and they're actually uh, setting up police forces and traffic um, policemen and trying to get their con consolidate their control. Um, once you get out of a state of anarchy and you start enforcing laws, then you ipso facto become uh, the controlling force in the area and people start giving you some respect uh, and you become legitimatized. This can happen with any group no matter how violently they took control. And ISIS and Al-Qaeda understand this completely. The first thing that they do once they get in control of an area is they try to get the stores to reopen, they try to uh, get the electricity on, they try to uh, get schools going and run things, uh, get things back to normal, get the life going, get the economy going. Uh, but, uh, and so this is why uh, oftentimes uh, these uh, power plants and things are hit by airstrikes. Which, how do you, okay, let's say ISIS has taken over or Al-Qaeda has taken over an area. What do you do? Go for what, try to destabilize. Make people hate ISIS, not be grateful for them, for ISIS restore, uh, you know, beheading some of the people you don't like, for instance, or like the leadership or ex exiling them, or jailing them, or shooting them, or whatever they do. This is, unfortunately, the way things have always happened. Uh, and, you know, and then restoring the order. And people get grateful that, for that. People just want to live their lives. They just want peace. Uh, and they would probably almost not care who was running, run, running the show if they could just live and raise their kids and go to work and have a little fun, and have some food and a place to live and some clothes to wear, and some, just le live kind of a minimal, ordinary life. Uh, so people will embrace almost any kind of horrific tyranny for that, unfortunately. I mean, that's just the way people are. So uh, we don't, we'll see how it, how it works out in the Ukraine. We do know one thing, to get back to Syria for a minute, that... Uh, the U.S. is bombing, uh, apparently, an oil refinery 
they, they, at least one, in, in Syria. Now, why would they do that? They said that, well, ISIS overran the oil refinery and they were selling the oil and making money. So we had to hit the oil refinery in order to prevent ISIS from making money from the sale of oil. All, really? Already? They had their shit together, excuse my language, uh, that well that they're already selling the oil from the oil refinery. And they're that established? They just got there? Or is the reality that they hit the oil refinery to weaken the ability of the Syrian government to, to make the money from the sale of oil? Because the airstrikes are really not to get rid of ISIS. The ultimate goal, as Syrian Girl points out, is to, to weaken the government of Syria. And she talks about breaking Syria into three different parts. Assad in the west, the Kurds, and ISIS. I think that's what, the way she had it broken down, which was a, a model or a formula for endless war. So apparently this three-part partition would, I assuming that the, the Western powers would probably feel that this is ultimately not going to work and it would be just a temporary kind of thing. We don't know how that will play out. Uh, okay, so um, what's going on in the world also? A lot of interesting things happening in Hong Kong. And some people are, are saying that uh, the protesters, the, 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 they're calling this the, uh, the Chinese Spring, and the protesters are out. They're using the Occupy Wall Street tactics. They're uh, communicating with each other by electronic media, their iPhones and so on, or whatever they're using. The latest technology that the young people are into uh, it keeps changing. But they are uh, very, very strongly protesting and the Beijing mainstream or uh, main, mainland government is uh, pushing back with them with rubber bullets and tear gas and pepper spray and uh, trying to get them off the streets. And they're also using agent provocateurs. And to hear this, the word agent provocateur on NPR is unusual. But I heard it today, someone admitting that the Chinese government was putting in an agent, agent provocateurs into the ranks of the students and the younger people, those people who are occupying the streets of Hong Kong right now. Uh, and what does that mean? What is an agent provocateur? Well, an agent provocateur means someone who is recruited by the other side and probably paid to go in and pretend to be a protester and then but actually commit acts of violence in order to provide a pretext for the government that hired it to crack down on the peaceful protesters and it happens over and over and over again it's just standard procedure we've seen it in the United States with COINTELPRO and other programs over many decades uh, and it's used by governments it's uh, it's it's really a no-brainer, and the uh, and I the black the black block in the United States is a good example of a so-called anarchist faction which was present in uh, protests against you know all kinds of things anti-war protests uh, particularly, and it has been shown over and over again that the black block was actually government agents paid for by the US government and they go in and the black bloc are all almost virtually always the ones that break the big plate glass windows that start fires in the streets and throw Molotov cocktails and engage in all kinds of other mischief in order to give the police the, the pretext that they need to take out the batons and take out the riot gear and take out the rubber bullets and all the other uh, high-tech weaponry, the sound cannons uh, that they have now developed, and bring in the heavy guns, so to speak, to deal with the peaceful protesters. 
Uh, and of course, I think that the black bloc has been pretty much exposed by now. And I haven't seen them anywhere in the last few years. So they may have uh, vanished off the scene. We'll find out. Actually, the United States doesn't seem to be engaged in a lot of protest at the moment. There was a big uh, demonstration in New York City. Was it last week? I don't know how many people showed up. They were saying that hundreds of thousands were there. Didn't seem to get a lot of airplay. I don't know. But there was certainly, apparently, no violence that was to be seen. And that's probably because there was no agent provocateurs operating among the ranks of the protesters. And these were people that are essentially the group, the diminishing group in the United States that believes, fervently believes, that men, human, humanity is changing the climate of planet Earth. Uh, and I think that they're oftentimes kind of confused. They feel like that the climate of planet Earth would not change if it were not for human activity. Well, actually, the reality is that the, the climate of the United States would change, it would get warmer and cooler, even if humans did not even exist. That would be just the natural cycles, because why? Well, the main reason is, there are other reasons, but the main number one reason is because of the sun. The sun is the, is the master of planet Earth. The sun, without the sun, there would be no life on this rock of any sort. And uh, so absolutely, the sun runs the show. And the sun is an incredibly powerful uh, furnace, an enormous furnace, 93 million miles away, which is not that far. And of course, we know that without the Earth's magnetic field, the, the, the energy, the powerful forces, the plasma, the, the solar wind coming off the, the, the sun would destroy all life on Earth. So it would, take, it would strip off the atmosphere and, uh, and simply cook the entire planet very, very quickly. So uh, we're in the thrall of uh, the sun. And it's no coincidence that many primitive, so-called primitive people in the past worshipped the sun as a god. In a sense, in the real world, the closest thing we have to a godlike uh, entity is the sun. Uh, so, really, the the idea that the 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 human race could rival somehow rival or offset or change uh, the the waning and waxing of the power of the sun is just really ludicrous on the face of it. Uh, people don't seem to understand that, <laughs> I mean, we are so tiny, so tiny compared to the power of the sun. What can you say? I mean, even a volcano, one volcano has the power to temporarily change the global climate. It can actually cool the climate. One volcano, an enormous, one huge eruption, can actually cool the, global, the climate globally. But, and that shows the power of the sun in a way also, because uh, that's those powerful forces at work deep within the Earth that, you know, the Earth is a, has fire as heat inside. It's like a little piece of the sun is operating inside the planet. And when it erupts out on, into the atmosphere and blankets the Earth, then uh, that alone, I mean, obviously a volcano, the Earth doesn't have anywhere near the power of human beings. I mean, of the sun. 
of, in other words, a volcano does not have the power of the sun. A volcano has way less power. But yet, a volcano has way more power than all the human activity on Earth. So does that make sense? That, in other words, look at, the, the, at it from that perspective. People have an overblown sense of the power of humans. And I think we tend to do that. It's part of our ego trip that we have, the hubris. Um, okay, so uh, one more little tidbit. I've, I've been interested in Mars lately. The Indians just sent uh, another spaceship to Mars to take photos. <coughs> There's some incredible photos high, uh, of Mars. If you go to enterprisemission.com, you can see some blow up, some very high definition, uh, excellent photographs of Mars showing under magnification what looks to be structures, human or uh, made, created structures with right angles like cities uh, covered over by sand on the surface of Mars. And I think that what we're looking at here is remnants of an ancient civilization that was destroyed who knows how long ago, hundreds of thousands of years maybe, in the past. Very fascinating stuff. Uh, and it's nice to be able to get off the planet, at least mentally, once in a while, uh, and look at, the way, at uh, what else is going on in the solar system. EnterpriseMission.com is a pretty interesting site. And there are other sites too. Some of them are bogus. And, but I think this one has got some genuine stuff and some genuine solid research uh, going on. So you might want to look at that. Uh, yeah, unemployment is also in the news, down to 6.1% this week. Now remember, that's not the real unemployment figure. That's just the people who are still in the system looking for work, not the ones who've given up on the system. In reality, it's nothing like that. It's way higher. So that's all there is for today. Have a great weekend and sleep well.